Thanks very much, Nick, and thanks to all of you for coming. This talk is a contribution to the emerging genre of philosophy of COVID-19 science, the science and policy branch, I suppose. I'll talk for a moment about what I think we as philosophers of science can actually contribute to discussions around COVID-19 that is distinctive and worthwhile. We're not a public inquiry, I think questions of who is to blame for what, or who should get credit, or who should be rewarded, or who should apologize, or who should go to prison, these are not our questions as philosophers. We're also not journalists, our job is not really to tell gripping, compelling narratives of what has happened this year. And we're also not at the table when decisions are made much as we might like to be. None of the decisions I'm going to be talking about in this talk involve philosophers of science in the decision-making process. But we can at least study the table. We can study how those decisions were made. Why should we study the table? Well, we might have various goals in view. I think one goal we might have is to construct generalizable norms for effective scientific advising that hopefully go beyond this case to be useful in future emergencies and other contexts outside the UK. We also might want a better understanding of how normal advising differs from advising in extremis. And that's going to be one of the key themes of this talk. And we might also want a better understanding of how the government advisor dynamic plays out, how that relationship subtle relationship between a government and its advisors plays out in extremis and how the science and values nexus or dynamic works out in extremis and I'll have all of those goals in view in this talk my focus will be on several resources that we can use as philosophers of science to try and make progress towards those goals one thing you can really say it, on, on behalf of the government in its favour this year has been the transparency of the scientific advising it's received. And in particular, SAGE, the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies, has been impressively transparent. More than 60 meetings have occurred this year, and the minutes are published very soon after the meetings. 61 sets are currently publicly available. SAGE feeds into COBRA, it's represented at COBRA, at least in the early stages of the COVID-19 crisis, COBRA was the main decision-making body. This is the committee cabinet office briefing rooms, they call it, that is traditionally but not always chaired by the prime minister. The minutes from COBRA meetings are not made available. The fact that such meetings have happened is not even made available. But by looking at the stage minutes, we can get quite a clear sense of the advice that was being fed into those meetings. We also have the minutes from NERVTAG, the New and Emerging Respiratory Viruses Threat Advisory Group. Fantastic acronym. 38 sets of minutes from that group are available as well. Now, NERVTAG feeds advice into SAGE. We also have numerous papers and so-called consensus statements from SPY-M scientific uh, pandemic influenza modeling group that at the start of the crisis was transformed into a subcommittee of SAGE. And we have select committee testimony as well from the Science and Technology Select Committee and the Health and Social Care Select Committee. Now, I haven't uh, had time to go through all of this in micro detail. I'd really, be really pleased to hear from people who are interested in working with with me on this, this rather large volume of information. I think, for example, that it could be a fantastic MSc dissertation project to really mine some of these resources in relation to those goals above. Here I'm going to be focusing on a particular period, the UK's initial response to COVID-19. 22nd of January, when SAGE met for the first time, they called it precautionary SAGE, through to 23rd of March, when a national lockdown was brought in. 
I'll be thinking about three key themes and I'll, and I'll break for questions at the end of each, discuss, each discussion of each theme. The normative force of advice, reasonable worst case scenarios and their role in decision making, and the difference between independence and neutrality. There's more I could talk about, but I'm going to focus on these three themes. If there's time, and I fear time may be against me, I'd also love to give an epilogue, which is about September 2020. So first theme, the normative force of advice. We hear this slogan, and Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, has used this slogan in a select committee. Advisors advise and ministers decide. It's a good slogan. What does that mean in practice? That is a very general statement of how the people on stage see the relationship between advisors and ministers. Doesn't give us a lot of detail. I think compatible with that slogan are three broad approaches to thinking about the advisor government relationship and the sort of advice advisors should be giving. And I think it's useful to introduce three categories at this point. You can think that the role of an advisory group like SAGE is to not give any unconditional recommendations at all, but rather to provide conditionals. Conditionals of the form, well, if your goal is this, we think this will be effective. If on the other hand, your goal is this, you may find this alternative option effective. You present various means to end relationships without providing a normative recommendation for any one of those actions. The second approach you could take is what I'm gonna call the disjunctive unconditional recommendation, where you don't just say, well, if your goal is this, this will be effective, but rather you do give a normative recommendation, but it's disjunctive in character. It's do this or this or this. And then a third approach is the single unconditional recommendation that simply says, do this. I think it's interesting to think about these three categories in relation to the SAGE minutes, because I think there's a broad trend that SAGE at the beginning of the crisis sees its role as one that falls under the NER category, the no unconditional recommendations category. Then there is a perceptible shift, a shift towards DER, towards disjunctive recommendations. And finally, a shift towards the single unconditional recommendation. Here's some evidence in support of that trend. There's a document, a draft advice document that's drawn up by the SAGE Secretariat on 26th of February that I think captures the received wisdom of, of SAGE at that time and that would have been, I think, widely circulated within government. It includes various statements that are clearly avoiding any unconditional recommendations. They talk, for example, about the various options one might take to try and mitigate a pandemic, including social distancing, including shielding, and so on. And they say implementing a subset of measures would be expected to have a more moderate impact than implementing all of them, still substantially reducing peak incidents, making a second wave of infection in autumn less likely. This might be the preferred outcome for the NHS. Now, the substance of what they're saying there is interesting because you can see at the forefront of their thinking is this concern that if you suppress the virus too aggressively, there will inevitably be a very severe wave in the autumn. And I'll come back to that point later, but I want to draw attention to the form the advice takes. They don't say what well, the NHS should prioritize. They just say this might be the preferred outcome. And if it is, taking a subset of measures, but not all of them, is the most effective way to achieve that outcome. And they say it's a political decision to consider whether it's preferable to enact measures at first, lifting them gradually as required, or to start with fewer measures and add further measures if required. That's striking because it is clearly not a purely political decision. This is an example of what we might call a mixed political scientific judgment. There's obviously a scientific element to the question of what the effects on the pandemic are of introducing all the measures at once and then relaxing them if you've gone too far versus introducing as few measures as you can and building them up as they become necessary. It is not just a political decision, but they don't want to make that call. They want politicians to make that call. 
And even more explicit is this comment from 4th of March, where they say, as if it wasn't clear enough, SAGE has not provided a recommendation of which interventions or package of interventions that government may choose to apply. So at the start of the crisis, they believe their role is not to make unconditional recommendations, as I see it. But then there's a change. There's a change by 9th of March, where we now get different kinds of language. There's the claim that measures relating to individual and household isolation likely need to be enacted within the next two weeks to be fully effective. And those concerning social distancing of the elderly and vulnerable two to three weeks after this. That's perhaps still compatible with, with NUR, but drifting in the direction of something normatively stronger. And then here's the claim that a combination of these measures is expected to have a greater impact. Implementing a subset of measures would be ideal. So we no longer have this claim that if the NHS's priority is to avoid a second wave in the autumn, then implementing a subset of measures would be an effective means. Rather, the claim is that that would be ideal. Normatively, that is what your aim should be. Whilst this would have more moderate impact, it would be much less likely to result in a second wave. So now that's disjunctive because, of course, if you're saying what you should do is implement a subset of the measures we've suggested, there are many ways to implement that. There are many possible subsets. Pragmatically, I don't think they're considering the empty set as one of the things, but there's many possible uh, sets of measures ranging from nearly all of them to just one or two that could be taken. That's 9th of March. Now, a big change happens on the 16th of March. You might remember that day. There's a paper published by Imperial College and, and, and given to, to SAGE with a very striking conclusion that is the first example in all of these published documents that I found of a single unconditional recommendation. They say they contrast various mitigation strategies. They contrast that with the strategy of suppressing transmission as aggressively as possible by doing everything at once, including school closures. And they conclude that epidemic suppression is the only viable strategy of the current time. It's the first instance I found of anyone in the UK government advisory network making a claim of that type. And it's simply because two things had clicked for them as captured in this famous graph that was widely circulated at the time. They already had models for some time showing that the demand on critical care beds would be enormous. And that you can see in, in, the, in the do nothing case, this requirement for almost 300 critical care beds per 100,000 people. But it was only in this paper on 16th of March that they put that together with accurate information about the number of critical care beds that actually existed in the UK. And they plotted that on the graph as a red line along the bottom. And that was what created a great deal of concern, one might say, because the mismatch between the reality of where demand would be and where the surge capacity was, perhaps had not been fully appreciated. Now, interestingly, they say in response to this that suppressing the epidemic as aggressively as possible is the only viable strategy at the current time. That clearly involves a political judgment. It is not just a scientific judgment. There's a political element to it. And in fact, if you read the paper, what they are endorsing under the heading of suppression it's something that is not considered politically acceptable even now, because what they describe as the suppression strategy is closing schools whenever cases start to rise sharply. And they predict in the model that this will have to be done for two thirds of the time indefinitely until a vaccine is developed. And there's this graph here in the paper saying, well, until about November 2021, let's say, schools will be closed two thirds of the time. The blue blocks there represent periods of school closure. To say that's the only viable strategy, that it's the strategy that must be pursued is a political judgment. It's one that even now politicians don't endorse. But one might well argue that that unconditional recommendation at the time was crucial to uh, inducing the government to take steps that were necessary. 
That paper by Imperial feeds into the advice given by Spy M on 16th of March. Or Spy MO, they add the O to indicate that it's an operational subcommittee of SAGE. They agree that this strategy should be followed as soon as practical, at least in the first instance. Strikingly, though, remember this is 16th of March, a week before a legally enforced lockdown. SAGE at that point still hangs on to DER to the strategy of disjunctive recommendations. What it says is that there's clear evidence to support additional social distancing measures be introduced as soon as possible. Grammatically a bit strange, like the previous uh, statement, but you can see what they're saying. They want to leave the government's options open. They want to make their recommendation disjunctive by saying take additional measures, but the decision of what those additional measures should be is up to you. And they don't at that time in, endorse school closures. They do two days later. Two days later, SAGE advises that available evidence now supports implementing school closures on a national level as soon as practicable to prevent NHS intensive care capacity being exceeded. And that in fact happened two days later, schools closed on 20th of March. That's the first and from what I've found only case of SAGE making a single unconditional recommendation, not menu of options, not if then, but rather do this, do this now. So what can we learn from this story, this slide from ner to der to sir? Here's a case I suggest that shows the limitations of ner and der in extremis. I think they're potentially sensible approaches for advisors to take in normal circumstances. But what's the problem here? Well, in this case, as I think is usually the case, there's no clean separation of evaluative or political and scientific judgments. They are thickly entangled. A decision about whether to close schools, for example, that's a clear case of a mixed political scientific judgment. What happens in that sort of situation if you pursue no unconditional recommendations, well, you just get back demands for a recommendation. I don't know what form those demands took, but I would imagine them getting increasingly fraught as early March progresses. Government clearly wants advice here about what to do. They're saying in public, we're following the science. I can imagine them screaming out to Sage saying, tell us what to do, tell us what the science says. Though, of course, I don't know that with speculation. The problem if you take Dürr, as Sage slips into further on, is that it's this rather awkward compromise. There's unintentional outsourcing of some scientific judgments to ministers, because you're still trying to avoid making those mixed calls. And in particular, those decisions about what social distancing measures to bring in, those decisions about what order measures should be introduced in and whether you should go all at once, or whether you should try and do them slowly and incrementally, the all at once option being epidemiologically more effective, but the incrementally option being perhaps more intuitive, that judgment is left to ministers. So this seems to me like a case in which Sir was the right approach. Now, of course, there are reasonable concerns one might have about Sir. To make a single un un unconditional recommendation like that, close schools, do it now requires value judgments, as I've been emphasizing. Now, those value judgments, if you take this approach, are being made by unelected advisors. They're being made by people like Neil Ferguson, Patrick Valance, Chris Whitty. And there's a real worry that there's no democratic accountability for those value judgments. The people in those positions have not been elected. There's no particular reason to think they reflect the values of voters. That's a really important concern in normal times. It's what we might call an accountability gap. No one is democratically accountable for these normative calls. I just don't think that's a decisive consideration in this setting. It leads me to my first proposal, that I think there's a normative difference between normal scientific advising and scientific advising in extremis. What do I mean by in extremis? 
it's hard to be precise about this, but what we were looking at early March is a, is a clear case, I think. We might say using the American terminology that there's a clear and present danger to public health that requires rapid action. I'm influenced here by Michael Walzer and his work on the so-called problem of dirty hands, where the idea in that literature is that there is a normative difference between the norms of political leadership in normal times versus in extremis. That in normal times, a political leader should adhere to the moral norms of the community they lead. But Walzer suggests in extremis, which is when the moral community itself is in danger of being destroyed, it may be you know, different norms apply, and it may be reasonable for a political leader to do things that violate the moral norms of the community in normal times. In a way, I'm extending that point to the scientific advisor and suggesting that different norms apply to scientific advisors in extremists, and that worry about accountability gaps that is completely reasonable in normal times can be suspended reasonably in situations like this. In extremists, the usual concerns about sir may reasonably be set aside. Some accountability gaps may be tolerated some examples of mixed political scientific judgments may simply be handed over to the advisors so that the advisor is asked to just make a single unconditional recommendation. Compromise is that I think ideally the government rather than the advisors should decide when that shift has occurred. There's obviously a meta call to make there. There's not just the mixed scientific political judgment but there's also that meta call about whether we're in extremists when those decisions should be handed over to the advisors in effect and their advice simply implemented, or whether we're in normal times where the advisor should stay away from making political calls and simply present menus of options. And ideally it would be the government, not the advisors that decide when that's occurred. Now that is not what happened in this actual case. In this actual case, there was no top down signal saying, we think this is a dire situation, we now want single unconditional recommendations, please. Rather, there was a bottom-up process in which the scientists at Imperial, in effect, took it on themselves to issue a single unconditional recommendation. Now, I think that may well have been the right thing to do in those circumstances, but I don't think it was ideal, and that ideally, it would be the government deciding that the situation is one in which single unconditional recommendations are required. So before moving on to the next issue, I'll pause there for any questions about proposal one. Okay, so my second topic is the use of reasonable worst case scenarios. This is absolutely at the core of SAGE's approaches to the pandemic from the beginning. You hear this term all the time. Implicitly, there is a principle that I'm going to call the reasonable worst case scenario principle. They don't explicitly state that, but it must be what's driving it. That if you prioritise planning for the reasonable worst case scenario, then you will also be prepared as well as possible for less severe scenarios. That must be the logic of it Otherwise, why the huge emphasis on reasonable worst cases? Now, what was the reasonable worst case scenario that they were using at the time? Well, it was in some cases highly pessimistic. You could even use the word apocalyptic to describe the assumptions they were making. There was an assumption that in the reasonable worst case, 80% of the population gets COVID and the fatality rate is 1%. So you're looking at around half a million excess deaths a figure in the almost 10 times the figure we actually had in the wave in the spring. There's also a pessimistic background assumption, not formally part of the reasonable worst case scenario, but in the background, uh, partly due to Public Health England, the contact tracing is assumed to break down once you have 50 cases per week. And another background assumption that's in the background is that interventions can realistically be sustained for 13 weeks. So when interventions are recommended, they are described as being in place 
for 13 weeks. Moreover, the modelling they're doing at the time of the reasonable worst case scenario assumes partial compliance. So it's assuming, for example, 50% will comply with household quarantine. This is initially described in the 4th of March memo as high levels of compliance. So they say we're assuming high levels of compliance, but it's only 50%. The modelling at that time robustly indicates that maximally aggressive suppression merely postpones the epidemic to a time when measures are relaxed. And that's crucial to understanding Sage's thinking in this period. This is a graph from a memo, the memos I've been talking about that were drawn up by the Sage Secretariat to capture the received wisdom in Sage at that time. And this figure features heavily that if you suppress too much, that's the green line, you make things worse later. So don't suppress too much now. Allow some transmission now so that you flatten the curve, as it were, and your peak is not as peaky. What this graph doesn't show is that all of these scenarios are completely apocalyptic in that NHS capacity is vastly exceeded in all of them, uh, with the, pos the only possible exception being the green line up to summer. But then the, the pessimistic assumption is that once it gets to autumn, NHS will inevitably be overwhelmed. Completely inevitable, all the models at that time show in lots of different ways that this always happens in the worst case scenario, that NHS capacity is inevitably exceeded regardless of mitigation strategies. Doesn't matter what you do, NHS is going down. There's this line in the 26th of February memo that in the event of a severe epidemic without action, the NHS will be unable to meet all demands placed on it. In the reasonable worst case scenario, demand for beds is likely to overtake supply well before the peak is reached. The words without action are deleted between the 26th of February draft and the uh, 2nd of March draft. To take account of the modelling that's been done in between and become available on 2nd of March, showing that this is with or without action. The without action qualification is pointless. So they're incredibly pessimistic, but in other respects, they're excessively optimistic. They assume that R naught, this is the reproductive rate of the virus in the absence of mitigation, is 2.4. Now estimates vary a great deal, but that's right at the lower end of estimates for R naught. The, the, the more pessimistic extreme is something like seven, R naught somewhere between two and seven. They assume 2.4. They assume doubling time of four to six days, even though the, the data at that time was suggesting a doubling time of about three days. So even people who had nothing to go on except the published figures about cases would have said four to six days is optimistic. And there's an optimistic background assumption introduced on the 25th of February that surveillance is good and that surveillance will give about nine to 11 weeks warning of a major epidemic. They're writing this less than a month before the lockdown comes into force on March the 23rd. So reasonable worst case scenario is this mixture of incredible pessimism and excessive optimism. What are the consequences of those choices well, the optimistic elements of the reasonable worst case scenario, when combined with that background assumption that realistically the maximum duration of any measure is 13 weeks, led to incredibly costly delays. And I think the scientists involved would themselves admit that, that because they thought the epidemic is not here yet, we've got at least nine to 11 weeks, and we need to time the measures so that they've fall in the 13 weeks across the peak, we should delay action. That logic was based on optimistic assumptions that turned out to be false. And secondly, maximally aggressive suppression was recommended against, as we saw in some of those earlier quotations, don't do everything, do a subset. There was a period of time in which maximally aggressive suppression was recommended against before 16th of March because it was regarded as mere postponement of the inevitable. It was regarded as putting us on the green line in that graph where we have lower cases now, 
But come the autumn, NHS capacity is completely overwhelmed many times over. So some reflections on this then, on the role of the worst, reasonable worst case scenario. Let's think again about that principle. If you prioritize planning for the reasonable worst case scenario, then you'll also be prepared for less severe scenarios. That's quite seductive at first glance, but we can see circumstances in which it is not true. It's not true if your reasonable worst case is not in fact globally pessimistic. I'm introducing this term globally pessimistic for pessimistic in, in all relevant respects, but is actually optimistic in some respects. And then reality catches you out by being worse in those optimistic respects. It's exactly what happened. R0 was almost certainly larger than 2.4. The doubling time was almost certainly shorter than four days. It's also not true if your reasonable worst case is one in which the pessimistic assumptions you're making turn out to justify some actions, delays or omissions that will be far from optimal in a less severe case. Now, that's the sort of thing a, lock a lockdown sceptic might say. I'm not uh, saying it to motivate scepticism about lockdowns, but rather I think what we can see is in, in this case that delays and omissions that would have been reasonable in the, in the worst case where you needed to avoid that green line don't suppress too hard because you'll end up on the green line heading for healthcare system collapse in the autumn. The delays and omissions that were motivated by that assumption were far from optimal in the situation we were actually in, which is not one in which healthcare system collapse was completely inevitable in the autumn. We're in the autumn now, and I think we can confirm that it was not completely inevitable. So, we see here the limitations of the reasonable worst case scenario principle. And that leads me to my second proposal, that reasonable worst case scenarios, if they're used at all, they should be globally pessimistic, which is to say, at the pessimistic end of scientific opinion in all potentially relevant respects, not just some. Of course, in doing that, you make the scenario less likely. So you invite the criticism now, why are you basing all your planning on an incredibly unlikely scenario in which everything falls out badly, unluckily? The answer to that is that reasonable worst case scenarios should not dominate planning in the way that arguably they have done. Other scenarios need to be considered too. And in particular, if there are some steps that are favoured in scenarios that are more optimistic in some respects, then they should at least be considered. And that was the case for maximally aggressive suppression in this case. Now, they should be considered. I don't mean they should always be tried because of course, do doing nothing is something that's favored in, 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 in an optimistic scenario or trying a Sweden style approach with no legally enforced lockdown is something that would be favored in a more optimistic scenario. So they shouldn't always be implemented, but they should be considered and a crucial proviso is that provided we have the option of reversing at minimal cost, if the evidence tells against optimism. And I would suggest that was actually the case for the maximally aggressive suppression strategy. It could have been implemented in early March, could even have been implemented in February, but let's think about early March. If it had been, but then it had turned out that that reasonable worst case scenario was the actual scenario in which releasing lockdown measures that are very aggressive inevitably leads to a devastating second wave. Evidence would have come, bad news would have come, so to speak, from other countries in the world, like China, Taiwan, Singapore, Korea. And so there would have been an opportunity to reverse that and say, let's gradually loosen these measures because we know we're heading for total disaster if we hold them in place and then, then release them all at once. So there was the option to reverse that at minimal cost. And this ties in with some of the things Brian Roberts was talking about in his talk earlier this year and that Suzanne Burry has written about. The importance of treating options differently depending on how easily they can be reversed. And the fact that an early lockdown could have been reversed easily if the assumptions had turned out to be too pessimistic is an important consideration. So pause there for any questions about reasonable worst case scenarios and proposal two.
So we've talked about normative force of advice and we've talked about the reasonable worst case scenarios. My third topic is independence and neutrality. What do I mean by these terms? Well, by neutrality, I mean that the advice remains neutral on politically contested value judgments. And that can be distinguished from independence, which is that the advice is formulated without undue constraint or influence from government. Now, these are rough definitions. I'm not going to attempt to provide a precise definition of undue because that is a place for debate. And I think it's through examining real cases that we can try to develop norms for what is undue constraint or influence. Obviously, some influence is needed. The government has to provide questions in a way. It has to, to some extent, set the terms, and reference, terms of reference for advisory bodies. It can pose questions and it can present constraints as well. It can say we can or cannot do this. The debate is about when constraint or influence becomes undue to the point of compromising independence. So in Sage's 68 page guidance document, weirdly, neither issue is raised. So neither neutrality nor the independence of Sage is discussed, even though there is some discussion of how subordinate bodies like SPY M relate to Sage. Regarding neutrality, it's clear enough from the minutes that Sage has this general aim of maintaining neutrality. If you're trying to see, explain the reluctance in early March to make a recommendation, I think that has to be part of the story that the, that Sage and presumably in particular, Chris Whitty and Patrick Valance do not want to be drawn into making political value judgments along the lines of which measures have unacceptable costs attached to them. Should measures be brought in all at once or should they be brought in gradually? They don't want to go there. It's also clear that in spite of that general ambition, they don't always succeed. There's a clear example of this on 11th of February. If you can remember back then, we were all outdoors back then. We were going to work in workplaces on 11th of February. In the minutes then, they said it's not possible for the UK to accelerate diagnostic capacity to include COVID testing alongside regular flu testing in time for the onset of winter flu season 2020 to 21. There's clearly a political judgment involved in that use of the term not possible. Because of course, with the political will, if you put in 12 billion pounds, and if you say it's the number one priority of the government, nothing else is as important as expanding testing capacity, you can expand it. And the Department of Health did expand it. And we now can get COVID tests. So what they said was not possible was in fact possible. And I think it is clear that they're not talking about logical possibility or physical possibility. They're implicitly making a political judgment about what sort of hurling of resources at this effort would be realistic. So they aspire to neutrality, but I don't think they always succeed. But in any case, it's not even clear to me that neutrality is even desirable in extremists. And that's an implication of my proposal one, that I was suggesting that when the imperial researchers took it upon themselves to make some political judgments about what could be tolerated and what could not, and they explicitly judged that averting healthcare system collapse was more important than keeping schools open. They made that judgment and they said, this has to be done now. It's the only viable strategy. I suggested that they acted reasonably in doing that. So I don't think that neutrality is even desirable in extremists. What about independence, though? Well, strikingly, from the minutes, government officials were and are present at the vast majority of SAGE meetings. From the 20th of February, Ben Warner from 10 Downing Street becomes a regular attendee. Dominic Cummings is not. He's registered as only attending two meetings, but that was then leaked to the press and became a source of great controversy when it was found out that the, the Prime Minister's chief advisor had attended these meetings. I was criticised by Sir David King, a former chief scientific advisor who founded the Independent Sage, as it's come to be known, a, an independent shadow advisory group in response to this that is explicitly criticising 
sage for not being independent by calling itself the independent sage. An addenda have been added to the published minutes to distinguish scientific experts from observers and government officials. They were not, that distinction was not drawn in the original minutes, but addenda have been added. So is David King right? Is this a violation of SAGE's independence? Is it an example of undue constraint and influence? Well, SAGE has a clear defense, which is that the government officials are not there to be scientific experts. The scientific experts give their advice on scientific matters and the government officials are there to provide input from the point of view of government departments and to listen. That is their official view. But I actually think David King is right, that I think there is still a problem there in that it's virtually impossible to assure, ensure that there's no undue influence. And I think that's the case even if the officials say nothing. There's no evidence that they did say nothing, that the, the minutes don't drill down into that kind of detail. Presumably they did say some things. But even if they said nothing, there would still be an issue in my view, because I think there are some points that a scientific advisor may reasonably want to make salient in a meeting of an advisory group, in discussion with other advisors, without thereby making these points salient to the government. For example, they may want to highlight sources of uncertainty in the evidence. I already said that the, the, the subgroup feeding into SAGE, SPY-M, is better at this than SAGE itself. Potentially people in the room may, may have wanted to say more about the degrees of uncertainty in the evidence. But you'd want to do so without providing the government with reasons not to act. For all you know, the government officials in the room are looking for excuses not to do what you think they should do. That gives you a reason to not make salient sources of uncertainty, particularly given that levels of uncertainty are not always well understood by people who are not scientific experts. And they may want to give a frank opinion on how government has interpreted past advice and may interpret future advice. They may want to say that this or that was not acted on properly, so let's word this in a different way in the hope of getting better results. And they may want to make salient some of the questions I've raised questions about what form the advice should take and how much normative force it should have. They might want to raise the issue of sir versus de versus ne. And all of that is very difficult when government advisors are in the room listening and are able to, inter you know, are able to react to whatever moves are made. In effect, they become part of a game, part of a strategic interaction should clarify, don't mean, don't mean game in the ordinary sense of the word, but part of a strategic interaction where issues that are made salient by the advisors may be used in ways the advisors don't want. And they know that, and so they have an incentive to remain quiet about certain things. So even if the government officials says nothing, by changing the character of the interaction that goes on in the meeting room, whether real or virtual, independence, I think, is compromised. And that leads me to two more proposals. The proposal three, scientific advising in extremists, may reasonably set aside political neutrality in the interests of giving advice on mixed scientific political questions. And I think SPY-M, in the example I talked about in the first part of the talk, acted correctly in doing that. They set aside political neutrality by recommending aggressive suppression they, they did, but it was unproblematic that they did. My proposal four is that independence, by contrast, remains extremely important, even for scientific advising and extremists. That's not a norm that we should suspend. And moreover, that even subtle borderline compromise, compromises of independence, such as the mere presence of government officials in the room, should be avoided. So pause there for any questions about proposals three and four. So I'm going to do the epilogue now that really completes the talk in a way. I've been talking up to this point about the period of January to March 2020. The epilogue, but I've suggested that my proposals actually capture potentially generalizable norms that are more broadly useful. The epilogue is about trying to illustrate that 
using an example from more recent history, September 2020. That of course, what we've seen in the UK is that a second wave has to some extent materialized and we are indeed living through a second national lockdown. How did that come about and how does it relate to those three themes from this talk? Well, let's think first about the normative force of advice in relation to September. There's an element of history repeating where again in September, Sage is very reluctant to use the single unconditional recommendation. What it prefers quite clearly is the disjunctive unconditional recommendation. In the minutes from 21st of September that have been discussed quite a lot, Sage offers a short list of non-pharmaceutical interventions, including a two week circuit breaker lockdown more than a month before the, the current lockdown was actually instigated and recommends that some consistent package of these interventions be adopted. There's no single unconditional recommendation for a lockdown or anything else. Rather, the shortlist is presented. This seems to be a conscious approach. Patrick Vallance has also talked about this in, in the select committee, that the aim is to provide a menu of options so that it's clear that ministers are deciding and that advisors are not deciding. Contrary to the sort of relationship between advisor and government I was recommending earlier. Consistent package was indeed implemented, a consistent package of one item from the shortlist. You can get into the semantics of what's meant by the word package, I suppose. But one of the items on the list was uh, advising people to work from home. And that was indeed implemented. But everything else on the list, including universities moving teaching online and the two-week circuit breaker lockdown, was not implemented. That's an epilogue about the normative force of advice. You could argue that, again, there should have been a shift to a single unconditional recommendation. In this case, it was not made. The measures taken fell well short of what it would appear as though SAGE felt would realistically be required and cases continue to rise. What about reasonable worst case scenarios? What's the epilogue there? Well, they continue to dominate planning. A new reasonable worst case scenario was drawn up on 30th of July. That was confidential. Despite the transparency that I praised, I praised earlier, they didn't release this until it was leaked to the spectator on 29th of October. There's a significant change which can be seen in the SPI-M consensus statement of 16th of September, that now the reasonable worst case scenario is not drawn up independently by SAGE. It is agreed with ministers, to quote directly from SPI-M. The ministers now, um, they're no longer meeting in COBRA. There hasn't been a COBRA meeting for on this issue for a long, long time, as far as I understand, but rather a separate committee has been created called COVID-S that um, has taken over the functions of COBRA. Um, and as far as we know, is still normally chaired by the prime minister, but this is, this is very opaque. No, no one knows any minutes from COVID-S. But the point is that the reasonable worst case scenario is now agreed there, that the politicians have taken it partly on themselves to in effect, perhaps negotiate the reasonable worst case scenario. The new reasonable worst case scenario introduces an assumption that cases will rise in the autumn, but then highly effective measures will be taken in mid-September and that the effect of those measures will be to reduce R to 1 by October. We've just seen what measures were actually taken, advising people to work from home, of course, the rule of six as well and things like that. It was part of the reasonable worst case scenario that these measures would be highly effective. That I don't think is coming from the scientists, in all honesty. I think that is part of what was agreed with ministers. So the new reasonable worst case scenario is once again over optimistic in important respects. The actual scenario is once again worse than the reasonable worst case scenario in important respects. 
the spy M consensus statements start to get very interesting because it becomes fairly clear that they are trying to point this out very explicitly. I can only speculate about the tone of the scientists in the room when they draw up these consensus statements, but my speculation is that frustration is building. 23rd of September, SPI-M reports that the actual scenario is already on track to be worse than the agreed reasonable worst case. 8th of October, SAGE agrees with this and reports that the actual scenario is in fact already worse than the agreed reasonable worst case. You might well think what on earth has happened here? How did this happen again? How was the reasonable worst case scenario more optimistic than reality twice? There was a very interesting comment from Sir Patrick Vallance, Chief Scientific Advisor on 3rd of November to the uh, Health and, well, forget which select committee, I think it was the Science and Technology Select Committee uh, or Health and Social Care, one of those. He said, we model what the Civil Contingency Secretariat sees as a reasonable worst case. And that is then modelled by the SPI-M modellers. When he says Civil Contingency Secretariat, I assume he means COVID-S. I think he is, uh, I think he's possibly been told not to use that term, even though the term is public knowledge and has been reported in the Daily Mail. Um, that is a dramatic reconception to some extent a disfigurement of the government advisor relationship. It is quite extraordinary really that the reasonable worst case scenarios are seen as subject to negotiation and, and regarded as a political judgment in such a way as to build in assumptions that to any scientist looking at this seem incredibly optimistic. This was a point made by Aaron Bell MP in this in this select committee. He said, uh, you know, in what way is assuming extremely effective measures come in in mid-September? In what way is that either worst case or reasonable? That's a sad epilogue, I suppose. It's a sense that some of those proposals I was putting forward earlier remain just as important now as they were in the spring. There's still this over-reliance on reasonable worst case scenarios combined with here problematic compromises of independence, further reinforcing, I think, the point that independence of scientific advice is still important even in extremists. What I hope is that in the future I might be able to give a further epilogue that has a happy ending that is in some way about how planning was better the next time but we'll see in general i hope that some of these norms for scientific advising that i've suggested based on study of this particular case do have more general relevance and that can be generally useful in shaping the way advisory structures are formed for dealing with future pandemics and future crises on that sort of scale thanks very much for your attention